book one chapter six of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by christopher smith chapter six state of theology witnesses for the truth the vaudois wycliffe huss savonarola john vessel Proles. having pointed out the state of nations and princes we now proceed to the preparation for reform as existing in theology and in the church the singular system of theology which had been established in the church must have powerfully contributed to open the eyes of the rising generation made for an age of darkness as if such an age had been to exist for ever it seemed destined to become obsolete and defective in all its parts as soon as the age should have improved such was the actual result the popes had from time to time made various additions to christian doctrine they had changed or taken away whatever did not accord with their hierarchy while anything not contrary to their system was allowed to remain till further orders this system contained true doctrines such as redemption and the influence of the holy spirit and these an able theologian if any such then existed might have employed to combat and overthrow all the rest the pure gold mingled with the worthless lead in the treasury of the vatican made it easy to detect the imposition it is true that when any bold opponent called attention to it the fanner of rome immediately threw out the pure grain but these very proceedings only increased the confusion this confusion was unbounded and the pretended unity was only a heap of disunion at rome there were doctrines of the court and doctrines of the church the faith of the metropolis differed from the faith of the provinces while in the provinces again the variation was endless there was a faith for princes a faith for the people and a faith for religious orders opinions were classed as belonging to such a convent such a district such a doctor such a monk truth in order to pass peacefully through the time when rome would have crushed her with an iron sceptre had done like the insect which with its threads forms the chrysalis in which it shuts itself up during the cold season and strange enough the instruments which divine truth had employed for the purpose were the so much decried schoolmen these industrious artisans of thought had employed themselves in unravelling all theological ideas and out of the numerous threads had made a veil under which the ablest of their contemporaries must have found it difficult to recognize the truth in its original purity it seems a sad thing that an insect full of life and sometimes glowing with the most brilliant colors should enclose itself apparently without life in its dark cocoon and yet it is the shroud that saves it it was the same with truth had the selfish and sinister policy of rome in the days of her ascendancy met the truth in naked simplicity she would have destroyed or at least tried to destroy it but disguised as it was by the theologians of the time under subtleties and endless distinctions the popes either saw it not or thought that in such a state it could not do them harm they accordingly patronized both the workmen and their work but spring might come and then forgotten truth might lift her head and throw aside her shroud in her seeming tomb having acquired new strength she might now again prove victorious over rome and all its errors this spring arrived at the moment when the absurd trappings of the schoolmen were falling off under the attack of skilful hands and amid the jeers of the new generation truth made her escape and came forth all young and beautiful but not merely did the writings of the schoolmen bear powerful testimony in favour of truth christianity had everywhere imparted a portion of her own life to the life of the people 
the church of christ was like a building which had fallen into ruin in digging among its foundations a portion of the solid rock on which it had been originally founded was discovered several institutions which dated from the pure times of the church were still existing and could not fail to suggest to many minds evangelical ideas at variance with the prevailing superstitions moreover the inspired writers and ancient doctors of the church whose writings were extant in many libraries occasionally sent forth a solitary voice and may we not hope that this voice was listened to in silence by more than one attentive ear let us not doubt and how sweet the thought christians had many brothers and many sisters in those monasteries in which we are too ready to see nothing but hypocrisy and dissoluteness the church had fallen in consequence of having lost the grand doctrine of justification by faith in the saviour and hence before she could rise it was necessary that this doctrine should be restored as soon as it was re-established in christendom all the errors and observances which had been introduced all that multitude of saints pious works penances masses indulgences etc behoved to disappear as soon as the one mediator and his one sacrifice were recognized all other mediators and other sacrifices were done away this article of justification says one who we may regard as divinely illumined on the subject is that which creates the church nourishes builds up preserves and defends her no man can teach well in the church or successively resist an adversary unless he hold fast by this truth this adds the writer from whom we quote is the heel which bruises the serpent's head god who was preparing his work raised up during the revolution of ages a long series of witnesses to the truth but the truth to which those noble men bore testimony they knew not with sufficient clearness or at least were unable to expound with sufficient distinctness incapable of accomplishing the work they were just what they should have been in order to prepare it we must add however that if they were not ready for the work the work was not ready for them the measure was not yet filled up ages had not accomplished their destined course and the need of a true remedy was not generally felt no sooner had rome usurped power than a powerful opposition was formed against her an opposition which extended across the middle ages in the ninth century archbishop claude of turin and in the twelfth century peter of bruges his disciple henry and arnold of brescia in france and in italy endeavour to establish the worship of god in spirit and in truth generally however in searching for this worship they confine it too much to the exclusion of images and external observances the mystics who have existed in almost all ages seeking in silence for holiness of heart purity of life and tranquil communion with god cast looks of sadness and dismay on the desolation of the church carefully abstaining from the scholastic brawls and useless discussions under which true piety had been buried they endeavoured to withdraw men from the vain mechanism of external worship and from the mire and glare of ceremonies that they might lead them to the internal repose enjoyed by the soul which seeks all its happiness in god this they could not do without coming at every point into collision with accredited opinions and without unveiling the sores of the church still they had no clear view of the doctrine of justification by faith the vaudois far superior to the mystics in purity of doctrine form a long chain of witnesses to the truth men enjoying more freedom than the rest of the church appear to have inhabited the heights of the alps in piedmont from ancient times and their numbers were increased and their doctrine purified by the followers of valdo from their mountain tops the vaudois during a long series of ages protest against the superstitions of rome they contend for the living hope which they have in god through christ for regeneration and inward renewal by faith hope and charity 
for the merits of Jesus Christ and the all-sufficiency of his righteousness and grace. Still, however, this primary truth of a sinner's justification, this capital doctrine, which ought to have risen from the midst of their doctrines, like Mont Blanc from the bosom of the Alps, has not due prominence in their system. Its top is not high enough. In 1170, Peter Vaud, or Valdo, a rich merchant of Lyon, sells all his goods and gives to the poor. He, as well as his friends, seem to have had it in view practically to realize the perfection of primitive Christianity. He, accordingly, begins in like manner with the branches and not the root. Nevertheless, his word is powerful because of his appeal to Scripture and shakes the Roman hierarchy to its very foundations. In 1360, Wycliffe appears in England and appeals from the Pope to the word of God, but the real internal sore of the church is, in his eyes, only one of the numerous symptoms of disease. John Huss lifts his voice in Bohemia a century before Luther lifts his in Saxony. He seems to penetrate farther than his predecessors into the essence of Christian truth. He asks Christ to give him grace to glory only in his cross and in the inestimable weight of his sufferings, but his attention is directed less against the errors of the Roman Church than the scandalous lives of its clergy. He was, however, if we may so speak, the John Baptist of the Reformation. The flames of his martyrdom kindled a fire in the church which threw immense light on the surrounding darkness and the rays of which were not to be so easily extinguished. John Huss did more. Prophetic words came forth from the depths of his dungeon. He had a presentiment that the true reformation of the church was at hand. So early as the period when, chased from Prague, he had been forced to wander in the plains of Bohemia, where his steps were followed by an immense crowd of eager hearers, he had exclaimed, The wicked have begun to lay perfidious nets for the Bohemian goose. But even if the goose, which is only a domestic fowl, a peaceful bird, and which never takes a lofty flight into the air, has, however, broken their toils, other birds of loftier wing will break them with much greater force. Instead of a feeble goose, the truth will send eagles and falcons with piercing eye. The reformers fulfilled this prediction. And after the venerable priest had been summoned before the Council of Constance, after he had been thrown into prison, the chapel of Bethlehem, where he had proclaimed the gospel and the future triumphs of Jesus Christ, occupied him more than his defence. One night the holy martyr thought he saw in the depths of his dungeon the features of Jesus Christ, which he had caused to be painted on the walls of his study, effaced by the Pope and the bishops. The dream distresses him, but next day he sees several painters employed in restoring the pictures in greater number and splendour. Their task finished, the painters, surrounded by a great multitude, exclaim, Now let popes and bishops come, they shall never efface them more. John Huss adds, Many people in Bethlehem rejoiced, and I among them. Think of your defence rather than of dreams, said his faithful friend, Chevalier de Schlum, to whom he had communicated the dream. I am not a dreamer, replied Huss, but this I hold for certain, the image of Christ will never be effaced. They wished to destroy it, but it will be painted anew in men's hearts by far abler preachers than I. The nation which loves Jesus Christ will rejoice, and I, awaking among the dead, and, so to speak, rising again from the tomb, will thrill with joy. A century elapsed, and the torch of the gospel, rekindled by the reformers, did in fact illumine several nations which rejoiced in its light. But in those ages a word of life is heard not only among those whom Rome regards as its adversaries. Catholicity itself, let us say it for our comfort, contains in its bosom numerous witnesses to the truth. The primitive edifice has been consumed. 
but a noble fire is slumbering under its ashes and we see it from time to time throwing out brilliant sparks it is an error to suppose that up to the reformation christianity existed only under the roman catholic form and that at that period only a part of that church assumed the form of protestantism among the doctors who preceded the sixteenth century a great number doubtless inclined to the system which the council of trent proclaimed in fifteen sixty two but several also inclined to the doctrines professed at augsburg in fifteen hundred and thirty by the protestants the majority perhaps vibrated between the two anselm of canterbury lays down the doctrines of the incarnation and expiation as of the essence of christianity and in a treatise in which he teaches how to die he says to the dying person look only to the merits of jesus christ st bernard with powerful voice proclaims the mystery of redemption if my fault comes from another says he why should not my righteousness also be derived certainly it is far better for me to have it given me than to have it innate several schoolmen and after them chancellor gilson forcibly attacked the errors and abuses of the church but above all let us think of the thousands of obscure individuals unknown to the world who however possessed the true life of christ a monk named arnoldi daily in his quiet cell utters this fervent exclamation o oh, jesus christ my lord i believe that thou alone art my redemption and my righteousness christopher of uttenheim a pious bishop of baal causes his name to be written on a picture painted on glass and surrounds it with this inscription that he may have it always under his eye the cross of christ is my hope i seek grace and not works friar martin a poor carthusian wrote a touching confession in which he says o oh, most loving god i know there is no other way in which i can be saved and satisfy thy justice than by the merit the spotless passion and death of thy well-beloved son kind jesus all my salvation is in thy hands thou canst not turn the arms of thy love away from me for they created shaped and ransomed me in great mercy and in an ineffable manner thou hast engraved my name with an iron pen on thy side thy hands and thy feet etc then the good carthusian places his confession in a wooden box and deposits the box in a hole which he had made in the wall of his cell the piety of friar martin would never have been known had not the box been found twenty first of december seventeen seventy six in taking down an old tenement which had formed part of the carthusian convent at baal but this touching faith these holy men had only for themselves and knew not how to communicate to others living in retreat they might more or less say as in the writing which friar martin put into his box et si haec predicta confitere non possem lingua confiteo tamen corde et scripto that is and these things aforesaid if i cannot confess with the tongue i however confess with the heart and in writing the word of truth was in the sanctuary of some pious souls but to use a scripture expression it had not free course in the world still if the doctrine of salvation was not always confessed aloud there were some in the very bosom of the church of rome who at least feared not to declare openly against the abuses which dishonoured it scarcely had the councils of constant and baal which condemned huss and his followers been held than the noble series of witnesses against rome to which we have been pointing again appears with greater lustre men of a noble spirit revolting at the abominations of the papacy rise up like the prophets under the old testament like them sending forth a voice of thunder and with a similar fate their blood reddens the scaffold and their ashes are thrown to the wind 
thomas connecte a carmelite appears in flanders and declares that abominations are done at rome that the church has need of reformation and that in the service of god one must not fear the excommunications of the pope flanders listens with enthusiasm but rome burns him in fourteen thirty two and his contemporaries exclaim that god has exalted him to heaven andre archbishop of crane and a cardinal being at rome as the ambassador of the emperor is amazed when he sees that the holiness of the pope in which he had devoutly believed is only a fable and in his simplicity he addresses evangelical representations to sextus the fourth he is answered with mockery and persecution then in fourteen eighty two he wishes a new council to be assembled at baal the whole church exclaims he is shaken by divisions heresies sins vices iniquities errors and innumerable evils so much so that it is on the eve of being swallowed up by the devouring abyss of condemnation this is my only reason for proposing a general council for the reformation of the catholic faith and the amendment of manners the archbishop of baal was thrown into the prison of that town and there died henry institoris the inquisitor who first moved against him used these remarkable words the whole world is crying out and demanding a council but no human power can reform the church by means of a council the almighty will find another method which is now unknown to us though it is at the door and by this method the church will be brought back to its primitive condition this remarkable prophecy pronounced by an inquisitor at the very period of luther's birth is the finest apology for the reformation the dominican jerome savonarola shortly after he had entered the order at bologna in 1475 devotes himself to constant prayer fasting and macerations and exclaims o thou who art good in thy goodness teach me thy righteousness translated to florence in fourteen eighty nine he preaches with effect his voice is thrilling his features animated his action beautifully attractive the church exclaims he must be renewed and he professes the grand principle which alone can restore life to it god says he forgives man his sin and justifies him in the way of mercy for every justified person existing on the earth there has been an act of compassion in heaven for no man is saved by his works none can glory in themselves and if in the presence of god the question were put to all the righteous have you been saved by your own strength they would all with one voice exclaim not unto us o lord but unto thy name be the glory wherefore o god i seek thy mercy and i bring thee not my own righteousness the moment thou justifiest me by grace thy righteousness belongs to me for grace is the righteousness of god so long o man as thou believest not thou art because of sin deprived of grace o god save me by thy righteousness that is by thy son who alone was found righteous among men thus the great and holy doctrine of justification by faith gladdens the heart of savonarola in vain do the prelates of the church oppose him he knew that the oracles of god are superior to the visible church and that he must preach them with her without her or in spite of her fly far from babylon exclaims he it is rome he thus designates rome soon answers him in her own way in fourteen ninety seven the infamous alexander launches a brief at him and in fourteen ninety eight torture and faggot do their work on the reformer a franciscan named john vitraire of tournay whose monastic spirit seems not of a very elevated description nevertheless declaims forcibly against the corruption of the church it were better for a man says he to cut his child's throat than put it into a religion not reformed if your curate or any other priest keep women in his house you ought to go and drag the women by force or in any other way pell-mell out of the house 
there are some persons who say prayers to the virgin mary in order that at the hour of death they may see the virgin mary thou shalt see the devil and not the virgin mary the monk was ordered to retract and he did so in fourteen ninety eight john lelier a doctor of sorbonne declares in fourteen eighty four against the tyrannical domination of the hierarchy all ecclesiastics said he have received equal power from christ the roman church is not the head of other churches you ought to keep the commandments of god and the apostles and in regard to the command of all the bishops and other lords of the church care no more for it than you would for a straw they have destroyed the church by their tricks the priests of the eastern church sin not in marrying and believe me neither shall we in the western church if we marry since saint sylvester the church of rome has been not a church of christ but a church of state and money we are no more bound to believe the legends of the saints than the chronicles of france john of wessalia a doctor of theology at erfurt a man of great spirit and intellect attacks the errors on which the hierarchy rests and proclaims the holy scriptures to be the only source of faith it is not religion that is the monastic state that saves us he says to some monks but the grace of god god has from all eternity kept a book in which he has entered all his elect whosoever is not entered there will not through eternity and whosoever is will never see his name erased it is solely by the grace of god that the elect are saved he whom god is pleased to save by giving him grace will be saved though all the priests in the world were to condemn and excommunicate him and he whom god sees meet to condemn though these should all wish to save him will be made to feel his condemnation how audacious in the successors of the apostles to order not what christ has prescribed in his holy books but what they themselves devised when carried away as they now are by a thirst for money or a rage for power i despise the pope the church and the councils and i extol jesus christ wessalia who had gradually arrived at those convictions boldly announces them from the pulpit and enters into communication with deputies from the hussites feeble bent with age and wasted by disease the courageous old man with tottering step appears before the inquisition and in 1482 dies in its dungeons about the same time john de goch prior at malines extolled christian liberty as the soul of all the virtues he charged the received doctrine with pelagianism and surnamed thomas aquinas the prince of error canonical scripture alone said he deserves full faith and has an irrefragable authority the writings of the ancient fathers are of authority only in so far as they are conformable to canonical truth there is truth in the common byword what a monk dares undertake satan would blush to think but the most remarkable of the forerunners of the reformation was undoubtedly john vessel surnamed the lights of the world a man full of courage and love for the truth who taught theology successively at cologne louvain paris heidelberg and groningen luther said of him had i read his works sooner it might have been said luther has drawn everything from vessel so much do his spirit and mine accord st paul and st james says vessel say different but not contrary things both hold that the just shall live by faith but a faith which works by love he who understanding the gospel believes desires hopes and confides in the good news and loves him who justifies and blesses him gives himself entirely to him whom he loves and attributes nothing to himself knowing that in himself he has nothing the sheep should distinguish between the things on which they feed and avoid a hurtful food though it should be offered by the shepherd the people ought to follow their shepherds to the pastures but when they lead them to what is not pasture they are no more shepherds and because they are not in their duty the flock is no longer bound to obey them nothing is more effectual in destroying the church than a corrupt clergy 
all christians even the meanest and simplest are bound to resist those who destroy the church the commands of prelates and doctors ought to be performed only in the manner prescribed by st paul first thessalonians chapter five verse twenty one namely in so far as sitting in the chair of moses they speak according to moses we are the servants of god and not of the pope according as it is said thou shalt worship the lord thy god and him only shalt thou serve the holy spirit has reserved to himself to foster quicken preserve and enlarge the unity of the church and not abandoned it to the roman pontiff who often gives himself no concern about the matter even sex does not hinder a woman if she is faithful and prudent and has love shed abroad in her heart from feeling judging approving and concluding by a judgment which god ratifies thus as the reformation approaches the voices which proclaim the truth are multiplied one would say that the church is bent on demonstrating that the reformation had an existence before luther protestantism was born into the church the very day that the germ of the papacy appeared in it just as in the political world conservative principles began to exist the very moment that the despotism of the great or the disorders of the factious showed open front protestantism was even sometimes stronger than the papacy in the ages preceding the reformation what had rome to oppose to all these witnesses for the truth at the moment when their voice was heard through all the earth but this was not all the reformation existed not in the teachers only it existed also among the people the doctrines of wycliffe proceeding from oxford had spread over christendom and had preserved adherents in bavaria swabia franconia and prussia in bohemia from the bosom of discord and war ultimately came forth a peaceful christian community which resembled the primitive church and bore lively testimony to the great principle of evangelical opposition that is that christ himself not peter and his successor is the rock on which the church is built belonging equally to the german and slavonian races these simple christians had missionaries among the different nations who spoke their tongues that they might without noise gain adherence to their opinions at rostock which had been twice visited by them nicholas kuss began in fifteen eleven to preach publicly against the pope it is important to attend to this state of things when wisdom from above will with loud voice deliver her instructions there will everywhere be intellects and hearts to receive it when the sower who has never ceased to walk over the church will come forth for a new and extensive sowing the earth will be ready to receive the grain when the trumpet which the angel of the covenant has never ceased to blow will cause it to sound louder and louder many will make ready for battle the church already feels that the hour of battle is approaching if during the last century more than one philosopher gave intimation of the revolution with which it was to close can we be astonished that at the end of the fifteenth century several doctors foresaw the impending reformation which was to renovate the church andre proles provincial of the augustines who for more than half a century presided over this body and with unshaken courage maintained the doctrines of augustine within his order when assembled with his friars in the convent of himmelsfort near wernigerode often stopped during the reading of the word of god and addressing the listening monks said to them brethren you hear the testimony of holy scripture it declares that by grace we are what we are that by it alone we have all that we have whence then so much darkness and so many horrible superstitions o oh, brethren christianity has need of a great and bold reformation and i already see its approach then the monks exclaimed why don't you yourself begin this reformation and oppose all their errors you see my brethren replied the old provincial that i am weighed down with years and feeble in body and possess not the knowledge talent and eloquence which so important a matter requires 
but god will raise up a hero who by his age his strength his talents his knowledge his genius and eloquence will occupy the first rank he will begin the reformation he will oppose error and god will give him such courage that he will dare to resist the great an old monk of himmelsfort who had often heard these words related them to flaccius in the very order of which proles was provincial the christian hero thus announced by him was to appear in the franciscan convent at isenach in thuringia was a monk named john hilton he was a careful student of the prophet daniel and the apocalypse of st john he even wrote a commentary on these books and censured the most crying abuses of monastic life the enraged monks threw him into prison his advanced age and the filthiness of his dungeon bringing on a dangerous illness he asked for the friar superintendent who had no sooner arrived than without listening to the prisoner he began to give vent to his rage and to rebuke him harshly for his doctrine which adds the chronicle was at variance with the monk's kitchen the franciscan forgetting his illness and fetching a deep sigh exclaims i calmly submit to your injustice for the love of christ for i have done nothing to shake the monastic state and have only censured its most notorious abuses but continued he this is the account given by melanchthon in his apology for the confession of augsburg another will come in the year of the lord one thousand five hundred and sixteen he will destroy you and you will not be able to resist him john hilton who had announced the end of the world in the year sixteen fifty one was not so much mistaken in the year in which the future reformer was to appear he was born not long after at a short distance from hilton's dungeon commenced his studies in the same town where the monk was a prisoner and publicly engaged in the reformation only a year later than the franciscan had mentioned end of book one chapter six